And we're live. Uh, welcome to Earful of Li Dirt. <laughs> it's I, your I'm podcast. Just, yeah, it's, uh, I, wow. Uh, I'm sick, sorry. I'm stumbling over words apparently. But um, Earful of Dirt Lineouts, episode 10. And today I've got Dave Williams, head coach, Glendale Raptors Rugby. How are you doing today, Dave? Oh, great. Thanks. Yep. Had a good uh, session with the boys this morning uh, in their kind of off-season tra transition into their pre-season. So uh, everything's going well out here. Thanks for having me on board. Uh, thank you for coming on. Um, so a question I ask every international player, because some guys don't know, because they never get told. Do you know what your eagle number is? Not off the top of my head. Somebody told it to me uh, on Twitter. Uh, but I was never formally introduced um, by the Eagles as my uh, Eagle number. I think it's maybe 354, I'm thinking. Um, I should close. know it. You are close. Um, I will tell you right now. You are number 337. Ah, there you go. Um, I, never, I never started a game, so I was always off the bench, so that's probably why. Um <laughs> 354 is uh, Jeff Hurlinger. H Hullinger. Yeah. I'm Jeff. Hullinger. Yep. Yep. I'm Jeff Rep. Yep. So I, it's always interesting because uh, for some people, um, in some unions, they make a big deal out of it, like uh, the All Blacks. I know that you're, you're about to enter the age of the Golden Eagles in a, you know, about five years. So that's when they're going to start talking. Oh, what's your eagle number? Rrr, rrr. Yeah, I mean, so, on the the last tour, on the I was with November with the Eagles. I know um, now that Dave Hodges, the general manager, is on uh, on their number, what number they are in the jersey presentations, and I think now the um, uh, even they get uh, their jersey number, uh, sorry, not um, their eagle number plus who they're playing against, um, put into their jersey as well, which I think is a really special touch. Oh yeah, that's really cool. Guys, wow. definitely appreciate it, and obviously it means a lot to them representing the Eagles and. You know, I wish him all the success in the future. So, um, you're from Bath, right? Yep. Yeah, I was born in Bristol like 10 minutes away and then basically uh, bred in Bath. Uh, went to school in Bath, did everything in Bath, played for Bath growing up. Um, and then went to Exeter University and then moved over here for my grad work and, and for the last 18 years of my life. So, yeah, phenomenal place to, to grow up. And actually just back over there doing some uh, pro development with my assistant coach and director of rugby. Um, we were, we visited probably, you know, six or seven different clubs and spent three days with Bath and they were phenomenal. Um, you know, just looking at different systems, what they, how they integrate their academy as we're doing here at Glendale, um, the whole training structures and their coaching staff are very open to us. We sat in all the meetings and, you know, it was a uh, definitely great experience to seeing what they do and watch some live games and they beat too long. So as a Bath supporter, I was very happy with that and hope they, uh, continue, you know, uh, beating Scarlets this weekend. Uh, yeah, that should be a very good match against Scarlets. Um, so, so when did you begin playing rugby? You talked about, um, you know, you came up through the A's grade system, Exeter. So, well, I was lucky. Uh, my brother was was two years older than me. Um, my dad was a coach down at Bath with the juniors. Um, every school I went to, basically, we had uh, different Bath players as teachers. Um, and then I had an ex Irish international who was. Uh, my junior school. So uh, he was my coach there. And, you know, Bath's a pretty hot better rugby. They were the best team uh, for a long time and they're kind of progressing back up that way now. So I was very fortunate um, growing up in Bath and going to rugby schools. And, you know, I played different sports as well. And uh, I thoroughly enjoyed my time back there. So you came up through, you know, Bath age grade ranks, like you mentioned. You made it onto the Colts. So like U8, U16, and U U18s. How did you stop? and not end up you know playing aside dan lyle uh well dan's a little bit older than me uh, i'm sure you won't appreciate that but uh <laughs> yeah, i'm not sure his exact age uh but he was older than me and uh i went to university down at exeter and then um i had the opportunity to come over to the states and, and do some grad work uh and progress from there and you know back then uh it wasn't professional um it was just going professional um and i chose you know i just chose to come to the states and i had an opportunity a great opportunity to come over here uh, which I grasped with two hands and, and kind of jumped in with both feet. And uh, I haven't looked back since and I'm loving every second I'm, I'm over here, to be honest. 
Exeter is one of the top rugby college, like well, university programs now in the UK. Uh, what was it like when you were there? Yeah, I mean, they, they, I think they won their university competition two years ago. Um, you know, I, I actually didn't play rugby when I was at university. They had a bit of a back injury, so okay. um, I didn't play there. And then as soon as I came over here is when I kind of resumed playing again. You know, obviously, uh, I've played for a few teams and, you know, I, I, it was great. I loved it. I loved the, the culture, the camaraderie, even playing D2 for the Springfield Rifles when I first came over here. Um, I did one session with my, uh, my college team and that was enough for me. Um, they weren't quite the standard or um, the kind of accountability that I want to want to associate myself with. So I moved on to the D2 side and then I was lucky enough to play for the Boston Irish Wolfhounds up in Lake Saranac, where I was up there for a presentation um, uh, for a company I work for. Uh, and then from there, I got invited down to Boston and uh, I made the travel an hour and a half each way a week and it paid off with us winning two national championships. Um, and then from there, I, I, um, I was working in the NHL uh, for the, one of their minor leagues uh, they had a lockout, um, so I got a job offer in Chicago, and that's when I took up um, actually assistant coach, uh, player coach as a, the uh, strength and conditioning coach for the Eagles. Um, and then from there, I played two years with the Chicago Lions. I uh, had a great time in Chicago, playing the Super League. It was a step up from playing for the Boston Irish Wolfhounds. Uh, then I got offered the job as, as a full-time strength coach for the Eagles out in Boulder. Moved, moved out to Boulder, uh, played for the Denver Barbarians for a couple of years, and you know, didn't make the World Cup squad, um, which is fair enough because I was not the quickest player and I shouldn't have been selected. Strength conditions path. Um, and then that was basically my playing days over. And I played a, f- a few games to Glendale, um, but that was when I was traveling a lot with the seven. So I really wasn't around that much. Uh, so I really couldn't, you know, kind of immerse myself with Glendale twice a week, three times a week because yeah. I simply, I was away a lot. I was away 200, 200 days a year, you know, with the various rugby programs I was with. I mean, you, you just mentioned it. Uh, you, you've been a, a bit of a vagabond when it comes to rugby. But now that I think about it, I sort of am now because I play with three clubs. But, um, you know, Boston Irish Wolfhounds champions. You were, I think, Goff's player of the year back in 2003 or something like that. I, that you are an enigma, my friend. Like, I can find more on, like, other guys' rugby playing career from, like, 20 years before you than I could find on you. But that was an interesting, uh, you know, thing to see with. Uh, well, I, I was uh, we, I was lucky with, for the uh, for the Boston Irish Wolfhounds. Great club, you know, phenomenal club. Um, great set of players. And uh, as a nine, when you've got a big set of boys in front of you, you're just sitting in an armchair making good decisions. And, it, you know, they, they were uh, Jason Rose, who's back in Ireland. Uh, we had Ed Coss, who's a phenomenal seven. He should have been an eagle, but he wasn't. Um, you know, we had a couple of other internationals and we had some great U S players, you know, just hard Boston people who loved it. And, uh, we all gelled really well as a team. Uh, and that just basically we progressed from there and, and did really well, you know, win the national championships two years in a row. Um, and then, you know, I just kept on progressing. I, I think, um, there's a, there's an issue in this country with, um, certain lower level clubs, not allowing their best players to rise up because then obviously they lose their best player, which affects their performances. Um, but I think, you know, the cream always has to rise to the top, you know, and coaches have to allow their players to go. Um, it's the same for me at Glendale. Like we have a lot of like national team players and I want them to play internationally. Like my, my goal is to get every single one of my players, if they want to, onto the Eagles, whether that's sevens, fifteens, um, under twenties or whatever it is. Like that's my job. That's my role is to make them better players. Um, I think other coaches don't have that same similarity in their, in their philosophy. They want to keep them to themselves stagnates the player um, and they don't reach their potential the best players have to be training and playing with the best players and I think as a coach if you can say to your player like go somewhere else and get better because you're going to be stagnated here and I want you to achieve your goals you know I think it's the same with any other walk of life whether it's business or anything else if, if you're a big fish in a small pond you've got to go improve you've got to get yourself better and I think, you know, the environment we create here at Glendale is very much that way. We want guys to come in and if they're not good enough, it becomes very evident for them, you know, and it's also me and my assistant coach has, has a conversation with them, but they need to realize that they're not quite up to standard and they can go then drop down to division one or drop down to the academy. And I think that's where the, these other MLR sides will get to. They'll get to academies teams and they'll then get more talent coming through. 
like when we were over in in England the last couple of weeks, Harlequins um, traditionally over time have over fifty percent of their first team players coming from their academy. Wow. Other clubs don't get they don't have the same philosophy like that, so therefore they overpay for players and they have to bring players in. So I think there's there's definitely a methodology to what we're doing out here. Um, it's not just to be cheap. We want to bring players in and give them an opportunity to go from high school. You know, not they're not necessarily big enough or strong enough or good enough to play men's rugby. They, there's a there's a has to be that gap in between, and that bridge is an academy team where that's under twenty or under twenty three. Last year, you know, we took three academy boys and played with us. They're all 18, 19 years old. I mean, that's great experience for them, and also that's great recruiting tool for us because we if they're good enough, they're old enough, in my opinion. You know, we're bringing other other academy kids in, like Dave Sinnett. Our academy coaches bring more players in all the time, and then we'll look at them. They'll train with us with the pro boys in the mornings and in the evenings as well. And I think that's just the way that we need to progress as well. That's that's um. I mean, going going youth <coughs> like academy like producing talent identification. It was interesting. Um, I interviewed Alan Yarde uh, a while ago uh, for who's the head coach of the Austin Elite, and you know he spent you know he's coached he coached five different teams. Uh, at various levels in French professional rugby. And at the time, you know, when he was coming up through the system for, uh, you know, to become a national team player, he ended up only getting two caps because of two injuries. And the way they were doing it is like, well, that, you know, specific squad of players are just like kept for four years. It's there's like, it's fenced and you can't really get in. So, you know, the two World Cup cycles where he was fit and ready to go, he suffered an injury right before and he was just done. But he, he noticed that when he was coaching, so in France at the time, first it was like players are in their prime, you know, 32, 33 at the beginning of his career. So in the middle, he took time off and went to Australia. And it was like, well, really the best of their career is when guys are young. And so he started when he went back to um, France to take up coaching again, he just started selecting younger and younger players because, well, younger players are more athletic and are becoming more talented over time because of coaching. Yeah. Well, you know, you get your, uh, your peak years as a male athlete, I think it's between like 25 and 28. So that, and obviously females are a little bit less than that. Um, I think for the male athlete, I mean, if you can really prime them when they're younger, I mean, and guys are getting much better now. I mean, some of the ridiculous talent that you're seeing coming through in the Premiership because of the injuries to the older players. I mean, you got Marcus Smith, you got Zach Mercer, both uh, like apprentices, apprentices with England, and they're playing. Obviously, Marcus Smith had missed a minute this this year for Harlequins, which is ridiculous as an eighteen year old. He's brilliant. Off, like, he's uh, crazy. There's numerous other players um, now because of the injury rate in the Premiership. These guys are stepping up and playing, but it gives them a huge amount of confidence to better keep on going to the full England honours. And it's the same for the US. Enough, And I think this MLR, they need to be given the opportunity, if they're good enough within their club settings, to prove themselves. And I think they've got the hunger uh, and the appetite to really progress through. And then it, it's, it's great. You know, even when, you know, Glendale, we selected a couple of 18-year-olds, the older guys like, wow, like they're coming through. Like we've got to step our game up. So it really builds competition within the club. Um, and they have to then keep on improving because you don't want people to stagnate just because there's no competition. Um, and I think you've got to get that continue like cycle of players coming through, um, but keeping the core squad together. And you always want to add a couple of players every year just to refresh your squad, keep the competition going. Um, but you have to maintain that core squad. You can't just change the whole squad every year. That does nothing for team culture, nothing for chemistry. And basically, you just bind a team in every year. And then they, they, they never win. If you look at the best teams in the world, you know, you look at the Patriots, you look at, you know, whichever the Crusaders, you know, they just bring players in a couple of players every year to make that core squad better. You know, if they don't buy into that, that culture, then they get binned out pretty quickly. And I think that we have to do that as well. Where I know rugby getting his, in his pro is, is, is very much his infancy, but I think the coaches and director of rugby's and the organizations have to be very strict in what's our culture what do we want to achieve at this level? And if a player does not fit into that culture, same in any business, then they've got to go. You know, they can go somewhere else. They might fit into a different culture somewhere else. We've done a good job with that. We've got rid of a few players that we brought in um, very quickly um, because they didn't fit into our culture. And I'm absolutely fine with that. Uh, I don't want a player to stick around if he doesn't fit in. And, you know, it's, it's not good for anybody involved. 
Timberwolves. So going back to you, so how long were you in the Eagle player pool? I know you, uh, in 2004, you had just like become eligible, but how long were you being looked at? Uh, you know, uh, so I was basically between the World Cups. Um, so I think I just became eligible right before the 2003 uh, World Cup. <coughs> um, no issues. Uh, then I got an Eagle pool probably right after that. So as soon as the, um, that World Cup cycle finished, then uh, I went to the Sevens first. I was lucky enough to play in Hong Kong and Singapore Sevens, which was phenomenal. Loved every second of that, uh, especially the Hong Kong, the granddaddy of Sevens. Uh, and then from there, I moved over to the uh, to the 15s and, and got a few caps there, and you know, and then got uh, wasn't selected for the um, 2007 World Cup. Fine, and I'm not not bitter about that. I wasn't good enough, and you know, we progress on. And luckily enough, I I went to three World Cups as a strength conditioning coach. Um, so I've had a great career with the Eagles, and hopefully, it it, it can in the future. So you you uh, sort of come full circle when you you know as an Eagles player, you. Uh, um, you know, took the, the nine shirt as a backup against Canada in 2004 in Tokyo. And then against Canada again was your last cap. Um, for like three and a half years later. Yep. So, at Twickenham. Yep. So how, what, how does that go through a player's mind that, you know, they, the same team they face, you know, like four years before is their last cap. Like when you finally realized that that was your last. I didn't, I didn't, but that never even crossed my mind, to be honest. Like kind of the, they're the arch rival, arch rival of the US. And, you know, we wanted to beat them every time as we, as we do with every team we approached. Um, I never even, uh, until you brought it up, uh, I never even thought about it. To be honest, I never thought I played the first game against them and my last game against them. Uh, like that didn't even come into my imagination. I was lucky that last tour, I wasn't even supposed to go on as a player. Um, I was going just as a coach. Um, Chad Erskine got hurt uh, in the NA4, I think, right before. Um, he he um, broke his ankles, and I got called into the squad uh, as a player uh, into that arena. So uh, I didn't even think about it. And actually, I had quite a good game that last game. But then Chad was better than me, and uh, hey, good for him. You know, we got on great. Um, we still have a quick chat now and again, which, you know, um, but good for him. He had a great World Cup, him and Mike Petrie. And Mike Petrie was... You know the nine in waiting, and obviously, you know that's a good selection by Peter Thorburn because Pete, sorry, um, Mike Petrie then played all the way through to 2015. So awesome, good for him. So um, you've mentioned you know being strength and conditioning coach for the Eagles. So in 06, you became the strength and conditioning coach. You know what made you pursue that avenue? Uh, well, ever since I was young, um, I always loved my training one of the fitness and any team I played on. Um, I was always interested in, in, in training the rest of that side of my career uh, and my physicality just as a player, as a person. Um, and I did sports science uh, in my uh, last two years at school, uh, high school. Uh, that Then I went to X University to do exercise and sports science. Um, and then I, I was coaching different teams whilst at university as well. Obviously, the teams I played on, I made sure they were the fittest and we did a lot of extra training outside of just regular training. Um, and then I came over to the States um, and went to grad school at Springfield College, which was the, um, the first and foremost strength conditioning college uh, in America. And I was lucky enough. Um, I found that. Um, a guy brought me over here, and it was phenomenal. I had a great two years there. I did a great internship with Bill Knowles uh, with some of the England rugby players. Um, I did an internship, and it was just progressed my career from there. And I've just moved on and... Um, yeah, I had a great time with the Eagles. Hopefully, they, they learned a bit off me. Hopefully, they're, they're fairly fit. Obviously, it could always always be better. But, uh, um, you know, they weren't full-time, which is always a bit of a bugbear of mine, uh, and also the other coaches as well. Um, because I think that's where you get the real benefit. And I think even um, when pro rugby was around, I think the Eagles took a, a big benefit off that at the back end of that because you had the players in the full-time training environment. So they were training daily. They were getting better. They were getting fitter. They were sleeping more. They were eating better. Uh, getting up at six in the morning, have a quick gym session, driving to work, you know, quick half an hour lunch at your desk, probably another four hours of work, drive into training and not just getting your proper rest and you know, nutrition. I think that's where professional rugby will really help the Eels. Um, and I really hope that the whole coaching staff gets behind every team, as the coaches, 
um, and increases our daily training environment because it's only going to benefit the national team. As I said earlier, I think that's, you know, well, it doesn't matter, you know, Fitzy, Nate, you know, myself, we're all involved in, a, in the national team. Um, you know, we want our players to go up. I just chatted to Nate the other day. Um, we, we talk all the time and, you know, he wants his players to go up, you know, um, and some of his players didn't get selected for the ARC this time around um, because then they've got, you know, a little bit of a spite in their in their in their mouth and their um, kind of um, forewind that they need to perform well in the MLR. So that increases their competition, that increases their accountability at training every day. They drive their own standards a little bit higher, so then they they know they're going to look at in the in the uh, you know with with the MLR. And now we're getting seen on CBS that the competition has to rise because they want to get seen, and then that pushes the Glendale players like you know Sean Sean Davis, Bryce Campbell. You know, Will McGee, you know, Johnny uh, Quill and then Ben Landry and a couple of the other boys we got here because they know that people are behind them. Everybody wants to get to that World Cup. You know, our, my players at Glendale, so our players at Glendale, they're desperate to make that World Cup. You know, every player, you look, you, you know, there's an interview with Mike Brown the other day from Harlequins. Everything he does at Harlequins makes sure he gets to the World Cup. That is a pinnacle of these guys playing careers. So they have to do everything they can to make sure they're on that plane to Japan in 2019. You know, I think as coaches, we need to make sure that they're on that plane. So how did you pull off playing um, sevens and then coaching yourself? I know, like... But I was lucky. I only played two tournaments and they realized I was slow over. So uh, <laughs> they were like, yeah, thanks for coming and uh, don't come back again. Uh, <laughs> basically, that was it. Uh, but I had a big engine, so I was fine. But that's not necessarily the best thing in sevens. It wasn't full-time back then. Um, so I was sending the play the, all the programs out to the boys and obviously doing it myself. Um but I think with that is that I have an intimate knowledge of of playing at that top level. So, you know, obviously it's been a while since I've played at that top level, but I do have some uh, inkling of what it takes to get there. Um, you know, even when I was working with some NHL players, you know, I know what it takes for them to get to that certain level, like how long their careers need to be, how much they need to buy into the strength and conditioning, to their recovery, to their nutrition. And the more education you give these players, the better they're going to be. Just simple as that. And so it's not beating them down every day and giving them more and more information. You know, it's the same as technique in the gym. You can't just go in and, and give them a whole bunch of technique. They have to learn it themselves. They have to learn off their peers. Um, but the more technique we can give them, you know, then the better that they're going to be and the more resilient that that player is going to be on the pitch, which is better for us because then they play for longer. And that's all they want to do. Yeah, that's, that's one thing I think we're, I mean, in rugby culture, like club wise, I think we're sort of missing depending on where you go because um, like it's a performance, it's a performance endeavor and, you know, it, not, not to really steer away from, you know, our conversation, but it's just something I, I've been uncomfortable with since I became a rugby player that at the senior level, it's not focused on uh, performance and it's just sort of, I mean, the club aspect is great, but sometimes you see a lot of clubs are more drinking clubs that sort of play rugby rather than, Hey, we have a match this week. Make sure you hit all your strength. Make sure, you know, we have a captain's run on Friday. We're not going out and getting plastered right after captain's run. Yeah. I think, I think, you know, at, at yeah. certain levels, that's fine. If guys just want to be social. No issues with that. Hey, good luck. Go and have a good time. You mates. And you know, who cares about the, the game on the weekend? You know, they still want to perform, but I think that there has to be, an elite level then there has to be a sub elite level and i think that straight after like the super league stopped um and i was obviously due to monetary reasons and uh, you know there's the, the financial crisis that went on with the us and people lost some money um there really wasn't anything behind that so you had the prp and that's now gone gone by its wayside the arp has gone by its wayside you know and now you know even for myself like we were just calling clubs this last year to organize fixtures there wasn't any formalized you know, structure within the US for the top teams to play against each other. You know, it's more left to the clubs to get on and organize it themselves. You know, obviously, I don't know what's going on in the national office. Um, but whatever goes on there, that's fine. Um, but we need our best players to be playing against the best players. And there has to be a structure and a formalized structure that and a league that gets, you know, gets in there every year. And obviously, Pro Rugby went by its wayside and the MLR has come on now. And it'd be great if the MLR grows. You know, we need more West Coast competition. We need more East Coast competition. You know, then we split into divisions to save money on travel because money travel is ridiculous. You go to the UK and you ask, and they ask us, you know, what's your major kind of deficiencies? And we're like, travel and insurance. You know, 
they just well, take the UK. Over. If you if in the UK, it's like their mass transit system. Is, so you have all the train. The train system's great. Yeah, which and, is so small. I mean, you get one but, end of the country in eight hours. I mean, you can't do that yeah. in some states here. Yeah, yeah and but, like that's awesome. Some, but I think yeah. with us, we, you know, with the US, you can get there's more access to people. There's many more people over here. So, you know, getting on CBS, I think, is massive. It's huge. So we can drive more people into the stage. We can drive more people to watch it on TV. So it's more visualized. You know, we can get there. And I think, you know, then we can command more sponsorship money. You know, if we if we get more people in the stage, we get the TV figures up, you know, then the sponsorship starts to come. But it's I think the MLL owners, MLR owners and investment groups, they really buy into this concept of the individual clubs making their own way yep. and doing the best they can. And I think that's the way that we're really going to get a footprint in the US. And I can only speak at Glendale. Um, you know, obviously I chat to a few other people, but I don't know what goes on there because I'm not there every day. Um, you know, we've got different VIP things going on. We've got different fan experiences. You know, we really want to make it, you know, a full proper day out. You know, go come to Glendale, you know, watch the rugby as, as the main event. But what can we have going around it that keeps on driving people to the stadium and they want to come back for more? You know, that's another reason why we went to the UK is like, what's their activation pre, during and post games? You know, what are they doing for our VIP? What are they doing for different people around the country, around their stadiums? Are, are they getting players access? Because people want to speak to the players. And the players have to be willing to go there and talk to the. They have to be, you know, it's only going to improve them later in life when they get a proper job. Let's be honest. You know, so they need to appreciate that and go there, be articulate, you know, and just explain their experiences. That's what people want. People sit behind a desk every day. They want to hear what these guys are doing every day, you know, it's, and, it, you know, once they get that feeling, it's like, you know, people spend a lot of money to go and hear an NFL player speak. You know, cause they, they, you know, almost they want to be like him. You know, it's almost like a role model. Their kids want to be, they want to grow up and be a Von Miller. They want to grow up and be a LeBron James. And, you know, sometimes, you know, the parents are kind of the, uh, the mitigating factor there when they're not tall enough or quick enough. Um, but I think our players need to stand up, be accountable, and, you know, just tell their story about how they got into rugby. And then that, I think that crosses over into their business life or whatever they pursue further down the line when, when rugby kind of, you know, passes them by a little bit. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I talk to, you know, different people from time to time. Like I said, I spoke to Dan Lyle yesterday and oh. I've spoken to another Eagle, Tony Riddell, and he's like saying this has to, you know, MLR has to succeed because player, like young players, you know, the, the young kids that are, you know, starting to play rugby at eight, nine years old, they, they need, I wouldn't say like an icon, but someone they can look up to. So, you well, you look at this, I think look at the sevens. You got the boys went to the Olympics. They can look up to Nate Ebner. They look up to Chris Wiles. Um, they look up to Carlin Isles. You know Perry Baker now, World Player of the Year. That's phenomenal. Like great for them. They didn't have a great show in the Olympics, but you know the US they love the Olympics. Everybody loves the Olympics. Yeah. And to see the US, you know, put their put their shirt on, you know, see the US rugby team at the Olympics is phenomenal. It's the same thing with the 15s. I mean. We're one of the most supported teams at the World Cups. I think in New Zealand, 2011, I think the, we had more traveling fans of any country come from the US. Wow. I think I was told that, which is ridiculous. And they would just travel around. They watched our games. You know, when we played Russia, we played Ireland, you know, and we, we progressed from there. But there's a huge amount of support in the US for rugby. You know, they're dying out for content. And which is readily available. I think NBC have done a great job. You know, Dan Lyle has done that. He's obviously with it, with those, um, with that role as well. But you can get it online. I can watch every single Premiership game every weekend, and I probably watch more rugby than anybody. To be honest, I watch probably every game every weekend. You know, but I can watch all the European stuff. I can, I get access to it, but it's not on TV. And I think the remarkable thing that the MLR have done is get this CBS deal because nobody else has done that. Yeah. You know, and six o'clock East Coast time is that's awesome prime time on a saturday night when you've got yep. massive audiences you don't have to worry about if somebody's got cable not cable they can flick on channel four and you can watch rugby you know and i think that's only increased participation talking about you can actually go hey mum and dad i want to watch tv you know let's plan our evening meal around that six o'clock rugby game they can pick up players and go yep. i want to be like him i want to be like a bryce campbell i want to be like a will mcgee or Sean Davis, and then watch him play internationally and at the World Cup as well. So, wow, I just learned a bunch. It was great. But uh, so back to you, man. Uh, so, you know, in 2009, you also became, you know, assistant coach in addition to the uh, 
to the strength coach for the Eagles sevens program. You know, I have personally, um, I got to watch uh, the Canadian sevens team back during Silicon Valley sevens. And I saw what their strength coach did and, you know, strength and conditioning in, as you know, is a very specialized thing in, you know, like in American football and in other American sports. And I didn't know at the time that, well, you know, you're a strength coach, but you're also a skills coach. Like you're doing all this other stuff. And this is when Mark, you know, Mark was explaining to me, he's like, well, Dave's actually been involved with Glendale for like 10 years. You know, he's our skills. I had him on as a skills coach for like five years after he, he was done playing. And I was like, Oh, I, I couldn't find it. It was like, so I was like, Oh, that's so now I understand that in rugby strength and conditioning coaches do more than just, you know, put, you know, put muscle on the body and just make guys huge, which is different. Well, I think it, it's, it, a lot of it is that, um, you know, some teams now are going, you're just a strength coach, but other teams kind of see, well, if he played and he's good enough, then why can't we utilize him in a different area? Because then he's more valuable to the team. There's more buy-in, um, you know, for him as, as, as a coach into the whole system, you know? And I think with my player experiences, um, you know, so I, I was definitely trying to be like a skillful player because I wasn't the quickest. So I had to make sure that I was improving in other aspects of my play. If somebody's a quick guy, guess what? He's going to get quicker because that's what he's good at. Well, I wasn't very quick. So I, I tried to improve that as much as I can, but there's a definite ceiling. Uh, it was not a very high ceiling, so I had to reach that. But then so I had to improve my skills and make sure that, you know, my box kicking was good off both feet, my passing left and right. You know, my decision making was better. So I think then that, then that just cut buys into my coaching you know can i explain that to the players do i can i make up different drills that actually make sure that we're improving what we need to improve on like improving their work their, their strengths but really working on you know their weaknesses and their work-ons um and that's where i kind of I've, i think i've done okay in um you know obviously now i've progressed into head coaching um and from a strength coach is a bit weird to do that but i think also in american football where you know especially in the ncaa where it only allowed a certain amount of contact time with the players every week I think they do a huge amount of work outside of that as well, where they can play, you know, different games with the players. You know, is it conditioning games? You know, does a coach need to lead that or kind of strength conditioning coach lead that? But you only do that as a strength coach if you speak the same language yeah. as the skills coaches. If you don't speak the same language, then you're a waste of time. And then yeah, go in the gym and that's the only yeah. that's the only thing you're gonna do with this team because you can't speak the same language. In U.S. football, in especially the collegiate system, because they have a cap on hours, like <coughs> out of season, the person that over a four-year period, the person that I would say owns the player, not not really, but the person that develops probably the deepest relationship with a player is the strength coach, because you know they spend more time with the strength staff than they spend with their position coaches over that period yeah. of time because out of well, I think that's that's like, I mean and you look at the salaries you look at the Alabama strength coach you look at the Iowa strength coach they're making over 400 grand a year because they do spend a huge amount of time with their players and you know with my role at Glendale being the strength coach and the head coach I mean I get to see the players more than anybody um, but it also means I can talk to the players more than anybody um, and gauge where they're at every day I mean you look at their fatigue levels you look how they come in the mornings you know some coaches may not go in the gym in the morning they don't see that and then the strength coach has to report to the coach you know, and go, hey, look, or they get their, their daily monitoring and however they do it. Um, but I actually think that's a bit of a benefit for me uh, with Glendale that I kind of do both. I mean, yes, is it more time for me? Yep, but uh, there's no issues on that side. Um, and I can see the players. I can see how they react every day to different training, you know, because I'm setting the training standards every week, the volumes and loads of our GPSs with our assistant coaches. It's, it's just all one big system. I think once you have buy-in from everybody, we're all going in the same direction then that's when you've got the best staff. You can't have coaches, players going off their own individual ways. You know, everybody's got to be building to win on a Saturday or a Sunday. You can't have the physios going, no, I need more and more and more time. And hey, uh, there's an interesting um, YouTube video on Eddie Jones and his strength coach. And his strength coach, um, as Dean Benson, I think his name is, was like, no, I want my hour every week. You know, I want my three hours a week with the players and I have to have an hour every week. And he goes, well, no, that, what's the point? You know, we're here to play rugby. We're here to get better at rugby. So my strength coaches need to mirror what Eddie's doing with his rugby. And if I only get eight minutes on a Friday, I get eight minutes, you know, because it's not about me. You know, it's about the team. 
And it's the same thing for me. It's like, it's great we're talking about me, you know, but it's not about me at the end of the day. It's about the boys who perform on a weekend. You know, yes, I might be the voice and, the, and the, uh, the face of it on TV and whatever, but, you know, it's the boys who perform. They put their effort in every week. They show up every Monday morning. You know, they're the ones lifting the weights, doing their speed sessions, interval sessions, doing their bad conditioning, doing their extra skills, you know, mental um, like, uh, psychology work as well. And they're doing all the video work. There's a huge amount of work that people don't understand how much time and effort it takes to be a professional rugby player. You know, yes, they get paid very well. Don't get me wrong. Like in other countries, not here. I shouldn't say that. But they get paid very well overseas. <laughs> and I think that will come. That will come oh. in this country. It will come and the players will get paid a lot more money. Um, but I think that players, people need to appreciate. They just think, oh, you train Tuesday, Thursday night, rock up on a Saturday and play. If they actually had to do what these guys wow. do every week, that's um, I club think, rugby. I don't. I don't yeah. think. Uh, I think people are starting to understand because I know what I know what you guys are doing. I mean, you're in the gym every day, early in the morning. Um, you, you, you're, you do field sessions. You do film sessions, and for your, I guess your match fee players, they have to, they have to put in all the all the work that your full time players do. But in addition to their, you know, what pays their bills. Exactly. So, you know, I'm, and that's the thing. I, I, a lot of players like Zach Fanolio, you know, Maximo de Archival, I mean, they've got great careers, great careers. You know, they've done really well for themselves and they're only progressing more and more. And, you know, I'm never going to tell those players, hey, here's a contract. Like, I'm not going to do it. Um, I want them to continue their careers because um, that's what's going to keep them happy for the rest of their lives and their families happy as well. You know, and they, and we've got a lot of the part time players. Um, we're very lucky here. Um, but they really buy into our culture. And we've got a good mix of, of full-timers and part-timers. Um, and they really buy in. They get their work done. Like Connor Cook, you know, he can't make it some nights because he's, he's working late at his performance uh, Jimmy works at. But then he comes in the mornings. Um, so we have a good culture. We, we mix players in and out. And, and that's just the way it has to be. And it's the same way in the premiership. You had full-time players, part-time players, and all that. And they, then they figure it out. So, I mean, I think it's only to the benefit of England. You look at them now, how good they are. So for you were the Eagle strength and conditioning coach under four different head coaches. So, I mean, I think that says a lot about what you did was pretty dang good, but you know, 2016 change, John Mitchell comes in, you know, what, what changed there? He just wanted a new staff. He, uh, he brought on uh, the sevens strength and conditioning staff and John Hood's still there now. So, Good for good, you know, good for them. And I was there for 10 years, um, you know, when I was um, a part-time um, player coach as well. So I had my time, you know, and simple as that, you know. So, you know, did it end the best way? No, it didn't. Um, but, hey, that's life, you know. And uh, I moved straight into pro rugby. Um, and then, obviously, I was lucky enough to go with the Eagles as defence coach in November. Um, so I progressed on and, you know, I had a good 10 years with the Eagles. I went to three World Cups, um, went to one sevens World Cup. So. I had a great time. You know, there's, there's a, you know, just the way it ended wasn't the best, but hey, that's life. Um, you move on, get on with it. You're a big boy, put your big boy pants on the next day and uh, you certainly get on with it. And I was lucky enough that, you know, with the Denver Stampede with Pro Rugby, I, I moved into that straight away. Uh, that was always going to be the case uh, whether I was with the Eagles or not. And uh, we obviously, we did, we did pretty well. We won the thing. And then uh, now, you know, we're obviously with Glendale and um, we just keep on going like that. So, you know, four different head coaches. What was, did each one have a different approach? Did they let you just integrate what you were doing? Oh, no, I mean, I, I think I might have been with more actually because I was with, uh, with Tom Billups um, and then uh, who's after him? There's Peter Thorburn. Uh, then we yeah, had so Scott I Johnson. I didn't, I didn't include Tom. So. Yeah, we had Tom Billups. He was great. He, you know, he was one who selected me as a player. Um, then I moved in to strength to, to a strength coach, and then Peter Thorburn came on in a couple of years, and then Scott Johnson uh, came in. And I still speak to Scott now, and he was a great coach, uh, great man manager. Um, and he obviously done very well in his career. Um, and then Eddie O'Sullivan was there, uh, and then Mike Tolkien. So they each had their own their own style, their own philosophy, their own training methodologies. Obviously, had different staffs coming in and out, um, and obviously, I was lucky to be the one constant during that time period. Um, so, I mean, I, I was very lucky and, and I certainly learned a lot of every single one of those coaches. I mean, did I, did I believe in everything they did? No, I didn't. Um, you know, and, and that then buys into, to what I want to do now. And the good thing, I think with all those coaches that they were very open, um, to feedback, 
you know, uh, were the training sessions, were they too long, too hard? You know, do we need to recover them a bit more? Like, what are we doing this session? Um, and I think that that's just, you know, you know, and it's every coach. I mean, some coaches are very good at being assistants and some are very good at being head coaches. Um, you know, so I certainly learned off every single one of them. And I was then with, you know, I was with, when I was with the sevens program, I think I went through. So, you know, I've been through my fair share of coaches and, uh, is that's the way that USC rugby approached it? The, the, the way that world rugby went at the international level coaches some coaches c- are coming though other coaches stay john mitchell was there for a couple of years and he left and now he's obviously with the bulls time as an assistant coach and he moved into the head coaching role you know and he was only here for a couple of years and, and then, he, then he moved on again so i enjoyed my time with every single one of them and i certainly learned a lot i learned a lot of uh, each coach individually as well so, so following that period, you became the backs coach for now the uh, defunct pro Stan Peters. Um, how did that come about? Um, Steve Lewis gave me a call. Um, we had a chat, and uh, yeah, I got basically got selected to that as a backs coach and strength and conditioning coach. So I was going to uh, perform a dual role, uh, and it actually turned out to be a lot more. Um, our defense coach left, so I took over the team defense. Basically, was our forwards coach. He looked after all the interior D. I looked after the kind of the wider and the team D. Um, and then I took over the whole team attack as well. Um, so basically it was only me and Pete coaching the team. Um, and we did really well. We had a great working relationship. Um, he did all the forward stuff cause you know, he was, he was a, he was a man mountain of a man himself when he played for the Crusaders and for Munster. Uh, and he was great. Like he, Pete, Pete and I worked really well together. Still mates nowadays. I went to his wedding on the West coast. It was great. Um, you know, and he, he's doing well. He, he's coaching for the Barbos. I'm trying to get him back for Glendale. So I hope he's listening so he can do some scrum stuff with us coming up. Um, and now I've got our manager for the pro team, uh, Kieran Brown at Teddy. Now he's the, uh, now he's the assistant coach for, for Glendale. Uh, and he's been with Glendale ever since it first started. Um, so he's a great resource for me and, you know, and, uh, he does really well with our, with our, with our forward pack as well. So, so what was your overall experience, you know, that like, you know, with, I guess the whole organization of that, you know, league? what with um yeah to be honest i had i think one conversation with doug um over email um only saw him a couple of times in person um so we just left our head coach and managers to deal with doug and pete and i got on with the coaching and we had a good team and we won it so i had a great experience um you know i, I was fortunate that i got paid all my money um whereas a lot of people didn't but hey that's that's the, for the courts to deal with and further down the line um, but we had a great experience here in Denver. Um, so it's, it, it was as simple as that. We, we had a really good team culture. We had a lot of good players here. And I think Pete and I did a good job coaching them. Uh, but it all came about Steve Lewis giving me a call and said, hey, you're interested? I was like, yep, um, certainly am. Because I wanted to get into coaching. You know, I, mean, I was a strength coach for, you know, 10, 12, 15 years. And, you know, kind of I needed to get out of that and, and get into coaching because that's what I wanted to progress to. Um, and I've obviously been lucky enough that I've been pretty successful in my very short coaching career remains um and i stay in this coaching gig for a for a long time but performances and victories dictate you know yeah. and i'm fully aware of that I think, I think you guys set yourself up with a very tough preseason uh under the merlin shirt i think you're gonna <laughs> it, you guys are gonna come out uh cylinders clicking so yeah well, i mean i mean obviously you know people look at us and go yeah we did really well in the fall and we you know we we beat old blue and you know, we went to uh, Ontario, came down to us, we beat them, we, we beat other teams. Um, but I think now the standard's risen. I mean, that, that wasn't, we, you know, we kind of, you can talk about setting the bar and what have you, but, you know, other teams now have the same salary cap. You know, we have to abide by that. Everybody has to abide by that. And you look at Houston, now they're playing. Um, they're going to play a lot of games before the league starts and good for them. Well, that's brilliant. You know, Utah, you know, same way, brand new team. Like San, San Diego, you know, another team. They were obviously a pro team. Um, but will they? And I'm not sure what their, their makeup for their team is. You know, obviously we played Austin can, last year. I can tell you three guys. <laughs> yeah, oh, I, I know, I know more than that. Austin last year as well. I mean, we we obviously we played them twice. We were lucky enough to beat them twice. We have a slightly different structure how we we manage our guys during the week and our training week. But it's up to everybody. I mean, I mean there's not there's not one way, you know, to to get the team to. There's many different ways to. 
kind of skin a cat if you want to put it um and i think you know i've got my structures here and i'm always looking to improve them i've been doing a couple of weeks of pro development over in england seeing different clubs and different experiences um, not just in rugby but other sports as well is how can i bring that back to glendale and how can we improve our training sessions make it more efficient and basically get the guys ready for that for that performance on a weekend so are you is 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 the the one year pro championship team ever gonna like at have a five year reunion and get and, and, and get uh, no. rings? Get rings? No, no. We leave that to the uh, we leave that to the American football boys to get their rings and, and all that good stuff. That's never been spoken about. Uh, I doubt we ever will. To be honest, um, I'm sure we'll have a bit of banter after this about it. Um, but no i mean we had a great time we had a, we had a great week after we won it we had a we had a great time during the season and i think those memories will always be in everybody's mind and you can't take away you know we, we uh, demo stampede and all the players and coaches we won that first inaugural championships and i like that will come about in glendale you know our aim is to win it um, we're here to win we're not here to take part um and all the boys want to definitely progress to those victories in the season and uh july 7th we're lucky enough to make the finals but we're not looking ahead. We take so let's talk. Yeah, it's the old cliche of one game at a time and all that. But you know, everybody knows when the finals are, as every coach does. If they don't talk about it, then you know they're looking to get relegated. So we all know it's there, and we all know we have to basically progress through it. Uh, so let's talk Glendale. You know, early years you were a player, and then you uh, coached skills uh, for Mark Bullock. Uh, what were the early years like building this program? I mean, Mark, he, he made this club, him and Mike Donovan. Mike Donovan built um, the structures around it and uh, Mark coached it. And uh, he's brought in different coaches from time to time and, you know, got the players in. Um, and it, it's been it's been great. It's been phenomenal. That's why I left the Denver Barbarians because uh, there's a few other things that went on with the Barbos, but they were a great bunch of lads. Um, I just wanted to be somewhere where they had the facilities, um, they had the training environment and the culture. Um, and I think it's taken a bit of time to get the culture right, as it does with every organization. Um, but, it, you know, it, everything, it was a brand new club. So you had players coming in and out. You know, you weren't sure if you could field a team on a Saturday. Uh, but now we've got, you know, three different teams. We've got an academy side. We've got two women's teams. You know, the women's got to that WPL final, just lost by a point, which is heartbreaking for them. Obviously, the PRP champions for Glendale a couple of years in a row. Um, Division One national championships. Um, you know, now we got the academy, got the high school kids, we got the after school program. So it is like an all encompassing club, and that's what I love about it. It's in on the elite, I think that it goes bleeds down all the way through the different levels. Through, you know, you got six year old kids, four year old kids running around at a night time, and I think that's brilliant. The chance we get for ball in hand for these kids, um, I think that's the way forward. You know, get them away from playing American football. I watched the national championship final, you know, I watched the semi-finals, watch the NFL. Uh, so I do watch a huge amount of sport to be fair. Um, much to my girlfriend's bugbear, but that's life. Um, that's, uh, Hey, she has to deal with that. And that's, that's it. Uh, but I think what if I got you, uh, five of those Georgia players to like go into your academy system? Brilliant. <laughs> Cause I was, I was just watching that and I was like, man, if, well, I think somebody said the other day, I think there's going to be, be 24 players from both sides going to the NFL. Jeez. That's awesome. Good for them. I mean, that, I mean, 24 players is ridiculous because only I think, like half a percent go to the NFL from college. And you get 24 players yeah. out of those teams yeah. and you get true freshmen playing. I mean, they're phenomenal. And great job on those coaching staffs for selecting those players and recruiting those players. And I hope those, those, those programs obviously will go from strength to strength. I think they got a huge amount of support uh, from both teams. The SEC, obviously, you know, people people who know football way better than me. You know, um, <laughs> they're a bit annoyed that the SEC the SEC guys got in a in the final four. But I think it was a phenomenal um, semi finals, and then obviously the final was was uh, was a great game as well. So, so let's uh, you know get into coaching. Something that I'm trying to learn, um, and because at some point I'm definitely going to stop playing rugby. So you've coached, you know, for about 16 years, you know, since you were at Springfield College in grad school. Um, so, and over that period of time, you've played for, you know, even before then for some great coaches, you know, Andy Robinson, Peter Thornburn, Eddie O'Sullivan, uh, just to name three. Um, how has that shaped your philosophy overall? Oh, massively. I mean, I, I've, I've taken uh, something off each of those coaches. 
you know, every single, I mean, you look at even when, when Thorbs was around, um, you know, he's a New Zealand All Black selector. Um, he started North Harbour. Um, you know, he's been through the New Zealand like system. He brought the over. He sent myself and Bill Leclerc down to New Zealand to watch your Blacks train for a week and, and do some pro development around the different clubs. So I could learn as, as a person and as a coach. Um, and then everywhere I go, every game I watch, I'm always picking up something different. You know, even when we watch some of these premiership teams train, okay, what are they doing there? Why are they doing that? Week to week. Um, what can we bring into the Glendale guys? Coaches are. I'm not like, like when, I want, when I watch a game, I'm not a spectator. And I am because I love it. Don't get me wrong. Um, but it's like, okay, what systems are they employing? Why are they doing that in that certain areas of the field? And go, right, now this is why I want to get into my team because I think that's applicable to what we want to do and it fits into our system and our style with our players. Then I look at some other things and go, I don't like that. I think that's rubbish. I don't think the game should be played that way. Bring that in. And if they, the players start doing it, then I go like, no, we're not doing that. That's not the way we play. That's not the way I want the game of rugby played because of this. Um, and then, you know, is there a different system? Do the teams play two four two? Do they play one three three one? Do they play different systems? Are they, are they manipulating their systems parts of the pitch? And if they are, why are they doing that? You know, so I'm always looking at that and then looking at how we can progress that and how do them do we put that into training? Because unless you put it into training and give them experiences of training that they're going to see on the weekend, then I'm not doing my job as a coach, nor is my assistant coach. How does um, the coaching staff you and Mark have assembled fit your philosophy and the culture that you guys have established? Oh, well, so it's me and Teddy. Um, and then I have the uh, Dave Sinn at the academy coach. He comes in and does some skills. So they're not always hearing my voice uh, every, single, every single day of the week, which I'm sure they're, they're sick and tired of hearing most of the time. Um, so, you know, it's good to get different voices involved. Um, I think as long as that's a consistent voice and they speak the same language as myself and Teddy, um, then I'm all for it. If they start going off on their same page, then the same as a player, then they'll just be asked to leave. Um, but they buy into the system. We bring the academy kids in if they're good enough to train with us. So it's that whole system through the club. And I think that's very important. Our D1 will play the same system as the pro, as the pro boys, play the same system as well. And it just depends on what they do within that. Um, Teddy's been great. You know, we have the same philosophy on playing. We obviously have our discussions. Um, you know, I want a certain like line out move. I want this, I want that. He may want it slightly differently, but... You know, we come to an agreement um, and we just move on from there. Um, but we, we're always building to the same performance on a Saturday. And I think if you get people buying in to that bigger picture, instead of just being, I've got the biggest ego here, therefore I'm going to do what I want to do, you're always going to be successful. And you, or not, you're not always going to be successful, I shouldn't say that, but you're going to be as successful as you can be. And I think then if your coaches are on the same page, then the players are on the same page as well. And that just then buys into a better culture, better system and everything. Did your sevens coaching experience shift any of your philosophy when it comes to coaching 15s? Uh, no, not really. Um, it's a very different sport, to be fair. Um, simply because, you know, sevens is great. It's very skillful. It's very fast paced. It's very intense. But the skills have to be there. Um, I think different opinion on sevens. I think that you can't, be a better player if you just play sevens you know there's there's the skills are higher um but you're more open is more intense i think you need to play 15s first to get kind of skills down and then progress into sevens i think that there's far too many players in this country now that just play sevens and their window of I mean, opportunity of playing thoughts it's ridiculous they need to be playing for sevens and 15s become better at both and suddenly you're not, not going to get a prop who's playing sevens and they shouldn't be they should be in the gym getting bigger and stronger working on their technique you know right <laughs> definitely will still work on their skills i mean there was a stat um we learned i think i think then like the more passes the forwards make the more success you have in a game so why aren't you working on these skills with your forwards instead of going just lift the line out and, and scrummage that's rubbish you know so we we everybody gets involved with all the skills so we do so many skill stations and warm-up you know, we got props working with, with, you know, with back three. You know, and if they're coming around the corner and 3v2, we got two props and a, and, a, and a back three player. Well, guess what? Those props better, you know, they better execute their skills. You know, and we, we, there's a huge amount of emphasis we put on that. And I think, you know, Sevens is very skillful. The breakdown's a bit different. Um, you know, more chop tackles, you know, less chop and top, obviously, because you don't want to burn too many players in that ruck. Um, ball placements are the same, basically. Variations, but it's just generic skills. And, you know, look at the All Blacks. You know, they don't do anything special. 
They really don't. They just do the, the basic skills at a very fast pace. Simple as that. You know, yeah. they're not the biggest. They're not the biggest players. You know, but their lines are running. What they do as a very basic skills and the, the, their skill execution under pressure is absolutely phenomenal. And also, then you you have the players like Bowden Barrett. You know, who can absolutely execute and just kill you from any part of the pitch. Uh, but they have the confidence to play from any part of the pitch. And I think, you know, sevens, you know, you can play from anywhere. Fifteens, like, teams are playing from anywhere. Like, Harry Malander did a crossfield kick inside his 22 this weekend. I think he's even inside his try line, to be fair. You know, and they still won the game. He's like, you've got to give the players confidence to go out and execute their skills. That's where, you know, the transition comes from. If you see an opportunity, allow the players to go and play it and don't, you know, don't berate them. Um, you know, if it didn't come off, at least they're trying something, but they make sure they try it and train it first. You know, you don't want to try a skill out in the game and then, you, you know, then things go wrong. So they've got to have confidence in training. That's up to us as coaches to give them those experiences. So you've already mentioned, you know, attacks. Uh, I, this is something I've been very uh, <coughs> getting into because I, I want this discussed at this kind of level, because I, I really think when you, when you look at in the American space, we're very systems based. And I was talking to Dan Lyle about this yesterday. Um, the AFCA has their, uh, has their big, you know, event, uh, this week, which is the American football coaches association. And it's a massive trade show and development center where, you know, people are learning new offensive systems, new defensive systems. People are selling their wares when it comes to coaching. And then you also are also going and learning, from you know top you know coaches in this country but i'll i have been struggling to find a lot of people talk about systems in rugby and now i'm starting to get a hold of it so for you what do you like to do um 1331 242 1331 1331 okay yeah there's a few slight couple of slight variations you can play off that um i think 242 um there's not enough skillful players in the pack to do that, um, I think you can put a huge amount of pressure defensively because you have two long passes from nine to ten, ten to the forward. So there's a huge amount of opportunity for the, for the defensive to come up and basically put a huge amount of line speed on you and negate that attack. Um, I think one three three one gives you more options, uh, allows players to be a lot more explosive, um, and just I think that's the best style and system. Um, and a lot of teams play the same way. What can you do to kind of manipulate defensive based off that system? You know, can you bring in different little plays? Um, I think Joe Smith. Is one of the most intelligent coaches in the world. Uh, you look at some of the stuff he plays with, stating what he sees, the All Blacks does. He, he has different variations, and, and that's why he's so successful. You know, he's very successful with Leinster, and he's going to be very successful with, with Ireland, and he has been. Um, so it's obviously definitely watching how other, other coaches approach that, those systems um, with the players they have available to them. What's your defensive system like? Um, I'm pretty set, pillar post one. Uh, get off the line, uh, outside shoulders, uh, double tackles as much as we can. Uh, look at your fold, getting around the corner, getting your width on D, and then relaunching. But if, unless you take care of that tackle, uh, you have to play soft all day long, and that's just a waste of time. So you've got to take care of the tackle first with your physicality, top and top. Um, then you're going to be pretty, pretty good, uh, pretty good set for your next phase of rugby. So, you know, crossovers, and you know, so you had a player. In the last year and a half, come back from trying to make an NFL team. Ben Landry came back to rugby full time. He chose to come to Glendale. What did you do as a coach to get him back in Eagles form so quickly? Stuck him on the Watt bike and the rower as much as I could. I don't think he <laughs> ran. He said he was in better shape and he performed better at the every single team he went to. He was with the pro pro rugby team for preseason than when he finished at the end of his NFL uh, training camp for the year. Um, they weren't big on conditions, all power strength, um, you know, and he was only doing a very limited amount of conditioning. So it was, for, for us, I mean, for me, it was very much start from scratch with his condition. He was a big old boy. He was 285, 290. Jeez. Um, so we had to bring that weight down. But then, you know, then it's just him just doing the hard work on the watt bike, on the rower, on the bad conditioning, on the boxing. Uh, and getting his volumes back up to where they need to be. And that was that was just it. I mean, it was hard work. He hated me. Uh, he probably still does, to be fair, when I tell him he's got on the Watt bike. Um, <laughs> but that's just, 
what it is. And you know, the, the, even the lads this morning they they went through a bit of a, an interval session on, on the rowers and the watt bikes. Um, but they know they need to do it if they're going to perform that way for the Eagles and uh, obviously for Glendale when the MLR comes around. Um, it's a, you know, it's just you have to be conditioned. You have to be, and there's there's only one, there's only certain ways you can do that, and that's just time and effort and getting the work done and you know putting the right CD in your head and uh, right mentality and saying right, I'm going to do this and it's going to hurt, but I'm going to feel better at the end of it. So now to get rid of all the all the serious stuff, what kind of beer do you like? I do like my uh, my IPAs to be fair, so uh, you know I do enjoy that. Uh, I do enjoy my beer, so I'm uh, you know don't, don't mind a quick red wine now and again. Uh, yeah, I'm a big IPA drinker. Six X was my my favorite ale back in England. Uh, but obviously that was a, numerous years ago, about a few when I was back in England. Uh, but any kind of IPAs is great. There's great breweries. I was just at Breckenridge Brewery last night with, a, with the guys just about to be uh, to be pushed off to some sand desert in the in the world to go and get some bad guys. So um, that was good seeing him and having a couple of uh, Breckenridge uh, IPAs with him last night. So nice, you know. Um. Are you gonna are you gonna pick up triathlon? Because a lot of scrum halves uh, seem uh, to be uh, uh, Kimball Carr. When you get when you get Kimball Carr on this uh, podcast, ask him how his uh, triathlon uh, experiences went. Because uh, so, my it, roommate for numerous years, I, I have thought about it. To be honest, yeah. um, I do triathlon in the off season, and I'm a hooker. So my girlfriend was like, "Let's do this." But Shane just, Williams, if you from Wales, yeah, I know Shane. Like, Shane, I don't know him, but yeah. He's like a from Wales. He's like a masters elite triathlete yeah. for Team yeah. Wales. It's I've I've always crazy. thought about it. I just uh, to be honest, just haven't put the time and effort into it. You know, I'm uh, I do a lot of workouts during the week uh, just to stay up with the boys now and again. So, but uh, you never know. Maybe further down the line. <laughs> so, what's the most American thing you like? Uh, probably to be honest, uh, sounds a bit corny, but the American dream. Um, I've done many things in the US that I would not have been able to do in the UK. Um, you know, training Olympic skiers um, whilst I was at grad school. Um, you know, being a head strength coach for a national team at a young age. Um, owning a few houses that I do now. Um, you know, I own a, a real estate company. Um, you know, things like that. I mean, doing what I do with Glendale. Um, you know, those, those opportunities and, you know, just being able to travel from coast to coast. I mean, I, I used to, I used to, go to san diego um every week for the sevens um you know it sounds bizarre but that's what i did and that's what i loved and you know i've driven basically the whole way across this country you know i lived in boston i moved to chicago came out here drove to san diego drove to bellingham a couple of years ago um you know for a mate's wedding with a girlfriend and the, and the two dogs at the time and just seeing what the u.s has to offer you know every state's very different um you know which i love you know, you can go, especially here in Colorado, you've got the outdoors and you've got Denver as a city. Um, you know, I, I'm just going to go to Boston in a couple of months. I'm going to see my dad. And then, you know, you can go to all over the country and there's so many different experiences. If you want to go get great jazz music, then also you can go to Nashville and, you know, you can go anywhere you want. And uh, I think it just offers so much more opportunities if you're willing to go and grab it. Um, and I, I've just done that. I think in England, they're a bit more stagnated. Um, you know, how old you are, what you've done, all that kind of rubbish. Um, instead of saying, well, if you're good enough, then, and it's up to you if you take those opportunities. And I think I've done, I've taken my opportunities um, for the most part. Obviously, some have formed by the wayside, um, but for the most part, I think I've, I've grabbed every opportunity I have. Um, and obviously, I have some very good people around me that need a mention as well. The most American thing I love about this country is, is the American dream. Is you, if you want to go and do something, you can go and do it and you'll find something to back you. You know, and that's that's it and that's why i'm still here and i will be here for for numerous years because i've got the old blue passport now and <laughs> nice nice um well that wraps it up for your full of dirt lineouts. uh thank you dave and we've got two more glendale people uh sean davies next tuesday and will maggie next thursday a week from now same time same place perfect thanks for having me